you do in a life or death situation? Sarah was attacked by a woman who wanted her unborn baby. She pulled out the knife. As long as I had my hand on that blade, she would not be able to stab me. Amy was hiking alone 20 miles from civilization when she fell more than 60 feet. I slammed into the rock and I thought, I'm alive. But it gets worse. I couldn't move either leg. You won't believe how she survived. Would you know what to do? That's what's coming up right now. I want to tell. Thank you so much for joining us today. You know, this show could change your life and save your life. Now, a few weeks ago, we all heard about the heartbreaking and courageous story of James and Katie Kim, who were found, really, who were stranded in the snowy mountains of Oregon. I want you to take a look at this. Recent news reports chronicle the nine-day search for James and Katie Kim and their two small daughters. The family had been lost in the snowy Oregon mountains. I'm really scared, actually. You know, I mean, I'm trying to trying to keep it together. You know, I just have to believe that there's some explanation for it. You know, you can't think the worst or else you're not going to get through the day. Struggling to survive and save his family, James set out on foot to look for help. Desperate to save her children, Katie breastfed her daughters so they would not starve to death and even burn their car tires for heat. Nine days later, she and the girls were rescued when a search helicopter spotted the SOS she stamped in the snow. Fast thinking saved Katie and her daughters from a fatal end. Sadly, her husband's body was found lying in the snow days later. Faced with a near death situation, would you be able to save your life? They did nothing wrong. James Kim did nothing wrong. He was trying to save his family. Well, their 11-day ordeal was an example of incredible strength and endurance during a life and death situation. Now, three years ago, my first guest also found herself in a life-threatening situation when she plummeted 60 feet and smashed into a granite boulder during a hiking trip. Take a look at this. I've been backpacking almost all of my life. I took my first trip when I was 16 years old. I had planned a 170-mile trip through Kings Canyon National Park. For the first 12 days of the trip, it was everything I had hoped it would be. It was absolutely magnificent. The next part of my trip took me to a more remote location, and that would be the Tehipite Valley. It was one of the most magnificent and the most remote places in all of North America. So that was going to be the highlight of my trip. I had begun working my way down this unmaintained trail. In some places, you could make out the trail. In other places, it was very unclear. So that trail plunges a vertical mile in three and a half miles. So it's very, very steep. But as I was working my way around a leaf-covered hillside, a steep hillside, I grabbed onto a rock with one hand and a tree with the other hand. And as I reached out my right foot to feel for a good foothold, the entire hillside crumbled. The rock gave way, the tree gave way. And in one instant, I went from safe to plunging through mid-air with a 60-foot drop and solid rock beneath me. Please welcome Amy to the show. Thank you. Uh, first off, I got to come back and ask the question, darling, come on with all the bad guys out there, bad people out there. <laughs> You're out hiking along trails 170 miles by yourself? You know, bad guys live in big cities. Okay. <laughs> Sure. For the most part, mm -hmm. and the less urban density you experience, usually the less bad guys there are. So you've been doing this by yourself. You've done these trips 120 miles by yourself yes. multiple times. Yes, I've hiked thousands of miles. This day, you're out on a 170-mile trip by yourself, day 12. <laughs> so you've already gone, what, 100 miles? I've gone about 140 miles, Montel. You take one step onto that rock Tell me, Amy, you knew it, didn't you, as soon as it cracked away? I had no warning until the fall happened. Explain the whole experience. You hit the ground, boom. Right now, I'm living right there with you. Tell me what's going on. Okay, I, 
I'm safe one moment. The next moment, I'm in midair and I'm going down 60 feet with solid rock below me and nothing to grab onto. I had about one and a half to two seconds and what I thought was, I'm dead, this is the end of my life, this is it. I slammed into the rock and mm -hmm. I thought, I'm alive. Mm -hmm. And I realized at that point that I had been given against all odds a second chance. Mm -hmm. I was still alive. And everything I did from that moment on was to increase my odds of staying still alive. First thing you did? The first thing I did was to take inventory. I was, I was laying kind of on my side and I pushed myself upright and I started patting my body to see what was wrong. I had snapped off a tooth. My nose was smashed. I had cut some bruises all over my arms and some of my fingers were kind of canting out at strange angles. <laughs> okay. yeah, none of this was good. Right. The worst thing of all was I couldn't move either leg. I couldn't so much as lift either foot. And for a backpacker, utterly alone, 25 to 20 miles from the nearest road access, this is absolutely devastating. Anybody else would have given up, Amy. People would have just gone, uh -huh, that's it. I, I would have you have given up in the same I circumstance? I wouldn't have given up. I don't think people, so. <laughs> other people would. I'm telling you, other people would just say, the heck with this. You start mustering. Immediately, you said you took inventory. Yes. But you also immediately started thinking plan. Did you One not? of the reasons I love to tell my story is I don't believe that anybody else would have given up. I truly believe that we will all do what we have to do to stay alive in the moment, whatever that is. All right, I'm going to take a break. When we come back, I want you now to go through. When we come back, go through the plan because this plan entailed one whole day. You were dragging yourself with three your, days well, and three nights. Three days, but the first day alone in all that pain, dragging yourself for an entire day. And you got about, what, 100 feet? I made about 50 yards the first day. Yards the second the first day, day, I made about 100 yards. Let me, Let me take a break. We'll be back right after this. Give Thank Amy you. a big round of applause. Thank you. The only thought that I had in my mind was, I'm going to die. I looked down at my right knee and there was a gaping bloody hole instead of a knee. I was 20 to 25 miles from the nearest road access. She insisted on giving me a hug before I left. I was very, you know, like I said before, weirded out at this point. She reached in for an embrace and I started to pull back and that's when she pulled out the knife on me. She pulled out the knife? Mm -hmm. On you, this nine month, six day late pregnant lady? And mind you, I think she's nine months pregnant too. Again, welcome Amy to the show. Welcome her. And I tell you, what Amy did the moments and the days after her brutal fall is what saved her life. I want you to take a look at this. Suddenly, I was looking at death. I had about one and a half to two seconds as I was falling to think. The only thought that I had in my mind was, I'm going to die. I hit the rock. My first thought was, I'm alive. The next thing that I had to do was take inventory and see, you know, what had happened to me. I had cuts and bruises and scrapes all over my body. I looked down at my right knee and there was a gaping bloody hole instead of a knee. When I tried to move my left hip, it brought excruciating pain. I couldn't move either leg. And for a hiker, that is absolutely devastating. I was 20 to 25 miles from the nearest road access. First thing I did was to apply basic first aid. I knew I had to stop the bleeding from my knee, so I got my first aid kit out of my backpack. I put disinfectant on my knee, put a rough bandage on it, and then padded it with all of my extra clothing. What I did was I checked my map and my compass, and I knew that down below the trail that I had been following and had lost was a larger trail. And as I gazed down my ravine, I saw that this little stream that I had fallen next to, I theorized that if I could somehow drag myself down the ravine towards the river, I could lay myself across this larger trail, and I would have at least a hope of being found. By the end of the third day, I had come to a place where I couldn't go any farther. I was getting weaker, I still couldn't move my legs, and I was about as close to despair as I had yet come. Uh, you know, and at that moment, you're laying there, you think it's over, because you got to a little spot where you would have had to have climbed over something, right? Like a 12-foot dam, earthen dam or something? Yes, I had, so, I had 
I had made my plan was to drag myself down this ravine despite the broken bones because I knew I shouldn't move myself, but if I died, it wouldn't matter. Mm. So my plan was to drag myself down this ravine to where I knew there was a larger trail. And that's what I did for the next three days. I dragged myself and also my backpack, which had fallen nearby. After I had dragged myself along for three days, as you say, I had come to a place where I couldn't go any farther. There was a dam of rocks and sticks in front of me and a ledge, not very high, maybe 18 inches high. And at that point, my legs were still entirely useless and I was pulling myself along with my hands like this. When I reached that ledge, there was no way that I could leverage my limp body up onto the ledge. Mm. So I realized that I wasn't going to be able to go any farther. So right then, you heard some faint, not then, but a little yes. while later, you heard a little faint whistle. I was about as close to despair as I had yet mm. come. I realized this was the spot where I would make my last stand. And mm. I called out one more time, just randomly. And the last time that I called out, I heard a faint sound. It sounded like this. Toot, toot. And I thought, I'm hallucinating. It's a bird. It's the sound of the trickling stream. But I also thought it might be the sound of a human whistle. Okay. So then you started slamming your pots together? I realized that if it was a human person whistling, this was my chance, Absolutely. perhaps my only chance. And at that point, I abandoned my calm and I went crazy, screaming at the top of my voice, banging my pots together. I whacked a hole in the bottom of my water carrier to use it as a megaphone. Anything I could do to attract attention because I was immobilized, I couldn't move. Mm. And then, I, like the cavalry in some ways, you looked up and who was there? It took about two hours for me to actually make contact. And when I did finally look up, there was my rescuer, Jake, standing there on solid ground a few feet away from me. He had somehow found me out there in the middle of hundreds of thousands of miles of wilderness. He had found me and he was standing there on solid ground. And he said, hi. I'm Jake. <laughs> and guess That's what? It. I'm not going to leave you alone either, right? I did. I said, hi, I'm Amy. We were very courteous. Mm -hmm. And Jake said, I'm not going to leave you alone. It was exactly the thing that I needed to hear. But I should also say, now that though Jake was there, it still took two days to get you out of here, yes. did it not? Yes. Because your injuries were so severe and they couldn't get to you. No. So rescue workers ended up having to do what? They ended up having to bring in a helicopter, right? I mean, a helicopter yes. had to come in and actually had to airlift you out of that ravine. One of the things that I realized is if each and every one of these people and these circumstances hadn't been in place, I wouldn't be here wouldn't alive be here talking to you today. Jeez. And I am so grateful. Well, every you time. know what? We're grateful that you're here. I'm going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to meet an expert that could give us some advice that could be the difference between life and death if you were caught. Now, you know, not a lot of you guys sitting there in this room are going to go out hiking 170 miles tomorrow. Mm. However, any one of us could be riding down the road, driving down the road in a car, hit some black ice, wind up spinning out and wind up under or over an overpass down on an embankment and 75 yards away from a car folks nobody's going to hear you our experts going to tell us how you might be able to survive that we'll take a break we'll be back right after this you know the simplest thing is a trash bag because your body, when you're in those climates, as you know, um, you yeah. know, you perspire or rain or snow, that's the first way that your body, you know, slips into hypothermia. But trash bag, that plastic doesn't breathe. So, you know, get yourself, make yourself a jacket out of any trash bag. take a little break for a second before we meet our next guest and just talk about this you know today we're talking about survivors of near fatal situations and the circumstances may be extraordinary but you could find yourself in a dangerous situation at the drop of a dime and not be aware of what you need please welcome the ceo of safety chick enterprises mm -hmm. kathleen <laughs> baby brother of the show. safety chick how you doing i'm doing good talk good. to me about this because i mean you know there are certain things that we should we were going to do a display in that and we'll talk a little bit about the things right. that we need for the display but i mean honestly there's stuff that people should have in their car we just recently heard about the family right. that got run you know drove down a wrong road got stuck in snow 
Now, here's wife and children in the car for multiple days. Husband has to take off and walk. Can't survive that. But if there were things in the trunk of the car, little things that were there that you could use, talk about this right. for a minute. You know, let's just step back for a second sure. and say that the whole concept of all of this is caring about your personal safety. Right. That's where it all starts. And we hate to wait until we're the victim or something tragic has happened mm -hmm. to do these things. Right. You know, it's it's just like the Boy Scouts, be prepared. It's just mm -hmm. like scuba diver, plan your dive, dive your plan. Very important. Right. You know, whether you're in the most vulnerable times that we have are when we're getting from point A to point B, whether that's going to the grocery store or going to the mountains. There are it, certain things that we need to be aware of. Yeah, you know, I mean, in the last couple of years, we all know the big, huge disasters that take place, but and any given day, like right now, we're probably going to have a really weird winter mm -hmm. with, you know, like heavy storms one week and the temperatures go up the next week. So you're going to have a lot of flooding, a lot of wa roads washed out. Danger's right around the corner. Exactly. And, you know, I live in California. We're talking mm -hmm. earthquakes. You That's know, and, fires and, and, and truly, <laughs> truly, everybody does in our area have an earthquake preparedness kit in their garage. I mean, it's a very viable concern. And in a state like that, you need to. But most people do not. Like these guys, how many of you in the, how many of you drove here or dropped? How many of you drive on a regular basis? Raise your hand. Got a car, right? You drive back and forth to work. How many of you have a survivor kit in your car right now? Good. And don't be playing. You do? Some. Really? What type of survival let's kit? Let's find out. Yeah, let's go. go. What go do they go have answer. in their kits? Let's <laughs> find out. Stand up for me, darling. Talk to me for a second. What's in your survivor kit in your car right now? I have water. Water. That he, um, <laughs> I have army meals. <laughs> okay, army meals are good. That he got. Okay, um, canned First food. aid kit. I have, mm -hmm. I have trail mix. I have peanut butter. Mm -hmm. um, but mainly is um, the water. Sharp object of any kind, like a knife. I do. That's in, in my trunk, first aid you know, kit. It's a road kit. Water. I have flares. I have the flares uh, are key portable too. shovel. Blanket. We have uh, that silver blanket that the reflective blanket yeah the reflective yeah. blanket a little warmth that's pretty good right yeah that's very good let me ask you a question in your car do you have onstar or any other emergency roadside service mm -mm. okay do you have a portable gps i don't okay that's the key in this day and age I mean, that's what, you know, there, there are, and also depending on the climate that you live in, if you live in the snow, you should have a container, you know, a safety container in the back of your car with provisions for snow climate. Well, you know, the portable GPSs nowadays also have a transmitter on them. You can get them just that will tell you where you are, but you also get one that has an emergency switch on it. Which, boy, I wish Excuse you had me. that. Excuse me, Monta, mm -hmm. I think you might be talking about a personal locator beacon. Correct. The GPS tells you where you are. It doesn't right. tell anybody else. Right. If you have a personal locator beacon teamed with the GPS you can press that button and the United States Air Force will find you within in 300 yards and, and anywhere on the planet they up until mm -hmm. this year last year they used to make those as separate items exactly now right. you can get them as a single item yes. and they're not that bad some of them are start you know I mean especially if you're a person who's hiking but you can also get one for your car $79.99? Yeah, I, I, have, I have a few of those. But also, in the next year, in the, in the years to come, you'll see the whole GPS technology changing dramatically where you'll have it all on your cell phone. And there, there are companies now that are developing software that, that you can literally go onto your computer and list six of your closest family members mm -hmm. that when you press a button on your cell phone, um, all those family members well, are notified. I'm not certain so. that a cell phone is a safety device. Where I was hiking, there was no cell phone But it will be attached to a GPS. GPS now that will now be mm -hmm. on a satellite. And right. they'll have a little emergency right. thing. Mm -hmm. Just an emergency. It won't work all the time. You hit the emergency button and bing, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, so the key is being prepared, right? Mm -hmm. Talk about some of those other items. She went through a good list. That's what you should have. Water, flares. Right. The flashlight. A, a flashlight. Ability um, to make a fire. The ability to make a fire, the flares. Um, and again, you know, your body needs oxygen hydration you know and to and to stay warm that's the whole those are the first things that you need to be concerned about if you're in that kind of a climate but you know the simplest thing is a trash bag because your body when you're in those climates as you know Absolutely. um you yeah. know you perspire or rain or snow that's the first way that your body you know slips into hypothermia but trash bag that plastic doesn't breathe so you know get yourself make yourself a jacket out of any trash bag and you're you know you're good to go the other thing is 
in terms of being stuck in the snow. You know, when you start your car and try to keep your, that's what happened to them, you run out of gas. Right. But think of this concept. When you're there and you're starting your car and you've got the heater going, turn it off every 10 minutes or so and let it sit for a while. It'll buy mm -hmm. yourself, you know, two to four hours you're out of gas. It could last you two to four days if you turn it off and turn on. Turn it off and on. Well, I tell you, you can come up on your website. Safetychick.com. Safetychick.com. <laughs> and get yourself some information. And I, I tell you, it seems like right now we're talking about something that's extreme because this woman, you were out hiking. You know, I had my trash bags, and my trash bags, those little plastic garbage bags that I carry in my backpack whenever I go on a hike, are one of the things that saved my life. Absolutely. Could you also use those as a tourniquet and help to protect your wound? I use them to keep my sleeping bag dry so that it would insulate my body and I wouldn't die of hypothermia. I also use them to keep, to put under my body, and I did use one as a tourniquet. So, so plastic garbage Respect. There you Good go, bet. for sure. <laughs> yes. Safetycheck.com. We'll take a break. We'll be back right after this. Thank you. <laughs> While nine months pregnant, Sarah Brady was attacked by a woman who was faking her own pregnancy. I truly believe that Miss Miss Intentions were to bring me to the apartment that day to cut me open, take my unborn child, and leave me for dead. Well, the next guest was nine months pregnant when she met a woman who secretly hatched a brutal plan to steal her child. Take a look at this. At nine months, pregnant Sarah Brady was busy preparing for the birth of her first child. She never dreamed that a friendly call from another mother-to-be would result in her fighting for her life and the life of her unborn child. I was registered at Babies RS. The first time Katie contacted me, she had called me up um, and had advised me that her name was Sarah Birdie and that she had received some of my baby items by mistake. She appeared to be very nice, very cordial, very articulate. I was actually impressed with the fact that she had went out of her way to contact me. I went immediately over to pick up the packages from Miss Smith. The encounter went well and Sarah didn't think much of it. But things began to get a little strange later that night when the woman called again. Miss Smith had contacted me later that evening to advise me that a second package had been received and she wanted me to come pick it up immediately. I told Miss Smith that I was busy and I didn't want to come at that time. She kept insisting that I come and pick up the package immediately. At first I thought it was somewhat strange that she was being persistent about it. But on the other hand, I did feel sorry for her because I did know that she was lonely and she had family that wasn't in the area. My fiance, Scott, thought that it possibly could be, you know, a new friendship for me, someone new to talk to. When Sarah arrived at the woman's apartment the next day, she quickly realized she should have listened to her first instinct. Please welcome Sarah to the show. You know, part of this show was to try to, to teach people some things and things that they, tools that they could use they found themselves in dangerous situations. But this is an entirely different type of dangerous situation that we could have probably taken care of in a different way, don't you think? Because when that woman called you a complete stranger. If I had thought about it, if mm -hmm. I would have taken time, I might have not going, gone over there that day. Which is part of the advice that I want to give because you were nine months pregnant, girlfriend. That's correct. Three days late, were you not? Actually, I was uh, six days late at so this point. So you went over and picked up the package? I went over, picked up the package. She seemed okay? Seemed fine, talked to her for about 10 minutes. Nothing unusual. Left? I left, went home. She called back. She called me later that evening, indicated that a second part of the package had received. Pushy lady. Which was a, um, swing that I had actually registered for. And she had all the information, sure. right? And plus I had family that lived out of town that wasn't able to attend my baby shower. Your fiance said, come on, nice pregnant lady, help So we out. made arrangements to meet the following morning mm -hmm. for me to pick up the swing because she had indicated to me she was moving and she wanted to get it out of her house. And But just like a bad horror movie, when you walked in the door, she locked the door behind you. She did lock the door behind me. She had indicated she lived in an old apartment building, had wood floors and a wood door and they tend to swell. So she said to keep it from sticking that she had to lock it. I didn't think anything about it. I was just there to pick up my package and go home. See, you know, I, I, it's, I don't know. You are a really trusting lady. I was. It was a pregnancy really you had trusting. your mind all crazy. I was, I was <laughs> trusting at that point. I'm okay. not so trusting anymore. Okay, so this, you did that. And now talk about what happens now that you're in this apartment. Because it wasn't 
overtly strange immediately, but it was No, right? she went back immediately to her bedroom, retrieved the box, which was a portable swing for me, brought it back. It was what I had registered for. Then she came in, we had small conversation, and she said, I can't find the air bill, which is what comes through UPS when to someone prove that this to, to actually sent it to me. So you could track back and thank the person that sent it right. to you. Right. She kept insisting that her and her husband were in the process of moving into a new home, that this was a temporary residence, that they were boxing things away and she couldn't figure out what he had done with it. She said, let me call him. You know, I kept insisting it wasn't a big deal right. because it wasn't. Right. But unfortunately, as time grew on and I was in the apartment, she wanted to give me a tour. I went through. She showed me her yeah, nursery. You're starting to feel a little weird, though, are you not? Not, okay. and not until I actually got it in her bedroom and saw an inhaler on her nightstand that said Katie Smith. And here I'm thinking she's Sarah Brody. But she said her name was Sarah Brody. Right. And you saw Katie Smith. Right. And you went... Okay. I was a little weirded out at that point. But you have to think, doing? here I've already been through her apartment. She has a complete nursery i mean stocks everything that you could possibly think of so i'm a little torn i'm not sure exactly what's going on i'm starting to get uncomfortable and i'm ready to leave at that point you went straight to the door to no the actually um she faked going into labor well that's right she fell down in front uh -huh. of me she faked going into labor and i helped her into the bathroom and then at that point is when i realized that there really was something wrong because she looked you in the face with some eyes that i i describe it as demonic I mean, I could feel the evil pouring out of her. You ran to, is that when you I went to the door? I slipped past her to the front door. Um, it, you know, kept insisting that I had to go. I had some errands to run. She was making very weird conversation. She insisted on giving me a hug before I left. I was very, you know, like I said before, weirded out at this point. She reached in for an embrace and I started to pull back and that's when she pulled out the knife on me. She pulled out the knife? Mm-hmm on you, this nine month, six day late pregnant lady. And mind you, I think she's nine months pregnant too. Let me take a break. Okay. We'll be back right after this. Well, Sarah's nine months pregnant, trapped in an apartment and fighting for her life and the life of her unborn child. Take a look at this. While nine months pregnant, Sarah Brady was attacked by a woman who was faking her own pregnancy. I truly believe that Miss Smith's intentions were to bring me to the apartment that day to cut me open, take my unborn child, and leave me for dead. The police had found in Miss Smith's apartment um, equipment to deliver a child by cesarean. When Katie pulled out the knife on me, my first instinct was to immediately get up and knock it out of her hand. Sarah ran for the door, but Katie had bolted the apartment door shut. Katie was able to retrieve the knife at some point off of the floor, and she picked it up and she started lunging it back at me again. I remember laying there on the floor and feeling that my child and I were not gonna make it out of this apartment and we were gonna lay here and die on her floor and no one would find us. I grabbed the blade and wouldn't let go, and I saw the phone and I was able to dial 911. <laughs> Katie kept continually coming at me, and I wasn't going to let her kill my baby. Girlfriend, you got the knife in one hand, her wrist, and a phone in the other hand, screaming, and just trying to hook back and get me, get right? Yeah, I actually <laughs> never knew that that 911 call had gone through until after, you know, I was at the police station. They but, advised me. But you're wrestling with her with the knife. I kept one hand on the blade of the knife, thinking that as long as I had my hand on that blade, she would not be able to stab me. Because you gotta think at this point, all I'm thinking is that she's trying to kill me. I have no idea that she's, you know, doing it for my and child. And unbeknownst to you, again, you didn't know this, but she right. had already laid out in the apartment everything she needed to do to deliver this baby by cesarean section. Everything from the gloves. She, the intent was to bring this woman over to her house to steal her child from her, leave you for dead, and act as if it was her baby. Right. The police had found other also women's registries as well. So if she wasn't going to get mine, she was going to get someone's. But eventually, somehow, you, said, well, you got uh, pushed her off. I was able to, I, when I threw the phone down, mm -hmm. I grabbed my other, my free hand that was holding the phone, I grabbed the other side of the knife, and I was finally able to wrangle it out of her hands. And I just started swinging it at her, because I figured if I started to swing, she would back up, and I would be able to flee from the apartment. Because you have to remember, I've already fled once from 
her actual apartment and she drug me back in. That's right, I forgot to tell you that. You yeah. didn't make it out the door. I she grabbed you by out. hair, pulled you back in the apartment. That is You're correct. hooking and jabbing. You grab, did you grab something like a fruit bowl or something? No, there was a candy dish and um, she had actually been hitting me over the head with it and I was able to throw her off my back and get on top of her and hurt her over the head. But that's when she retrieved the knife. So, so when I actually did get the knife, I thought if I just swing it, she'll back up. If I can just break free out of this apartment building, someone will hear me screaming for help. Because during the whole entire fight, she's telling me no one can hear you. She's cursing at me. She's being belligerent. She's telling me no one's home in the apartment building. I started to swing the knife, and she just kept coming at me. She was not going to let me leave. She had already told me, you're not going anywhere. And at that point is when I, what I thought had stabbed her in the shoulder area. Okay. And it actually pierced, I think, if I'm correct, her cardiac artery. She drops. She fell into her love, um, love seat and actually saw some blood coming out of her sweatshirt. And I immediately ran out the door and up the street and flagged someone down. And I had the phone and the knife, and I had continued to try to call 911. Um, and then the police arrived. Police arrive, you're taken downtown. I'm actually taken to the hospital first. And when do you find out? What happened to her? I find out about three and a half, four hours later after it's already been reported on the news that she has passed. So in that fight, you she, killed her in self-defense. She had bled to death, yes. Bled to death. Let me take a break. We'll be back right after this. After you go through all of this, next thing you know, you're the center of the police investigation. That is correct. Um, Why? Well, once, once this had happened, it wasn't six days later until I had my child. Mm -hmm. So I actually went into almost a whole nother week before Michaela was born. Um, in the meantime, the police had told me it's gonna take a couple weeks to wrap this up. We know you're not guilty. I'd already given my statement. They had searched her apartment. And one of the reasons that they believe that she had actually died is because she had went, taken her clothes off, stuffed the maternity suit that she was wearing. Everybody thought she was pregnant. After she was hid it in her closet. And I think it was five or six minutes after my 911 call that she called. So there, I mean, she did not lay and bleed to death. I mean, she was up, moving around, moved from room to room to hide this material. Um, it wasn't until probably about <clears throat> two months down the road when I learned that I was gonna become a possible suspect. And the reason why you were a suspect is because of what? There were allegations made um, by people in connection with Miss Smith that had stated that I was selling my child to Miss Smith for $5,000 and I was going to allow her to deliver the baby by cesarean and that I had changed my mind and didn't want to give the money back, so I killed her. So that, was her. Their, that was and, their theory. And, and there's, there's a woman on this planet that's going to let a lady con, con, had I, had perform it, a C-section on a kitchen table for $5,000? Well, had it even been feasible? Um, you know, I'm not a, a single mother. I'm with the father. I have a 10, 11-year-old stepson um, who I've been involved with for 10 years. I mean, I had a baby shower with 45 people. It just didn't make any sense. But here I was telling the police, I'll be cooperative. Whatever you need me to do, I'll be more than willing to do. And that's what I did. You know, I told them phone records, bank records, whatever you need to check, do it. I just want to get this done and over with and move on with my but life. But it took, when you say done and over with, you would think that they could clearly see this woman had, had coerced you to come to her place in an attempt to kill you and take your child. Yeah, they could there, clearly see this, but it took them, what, a year and yeah, a half to figure this out? There was not even a shred of circumstantial evidence. So had they taken a week or even a month to investigate the supposed allegation, I would have been fine with that. But the investigation drug on for 14 months before I was taken to a grand jury and for them to decide that I was not to be indicted. And wait, and, and if, if this had happened the way they claimed it would have, very clearly you would have had at least a phone conversation between us and you and that right. lady beforehand. Right. Someone would have seen you meet beforehand. Correct. There would have been information about you attempting to sell you. All this stuff and none of that was there. And I passed a six and a half hour lie detector test. Yet it still took what? I passed the lie detector test six months after it occurred and it still took another eight months after that before it was closed. How is your child, first off? She's great. She's great. She's great. Now, how are you doing? I mean, it's kind of, and, and I talk um, to people on the show all the time. I mean, your daughter's born six days after you had to take a life. I, I'm still having a hard time. It has been hard. You know, it's been an emotional struggle on my family, as well as a financial, you know, here I was in the midst of a somewhat small town in the center of the media, and no one wanted to hire me. Here I'd been a middle-class woman 
had a very good job, very independent, had a very nice life, to suddenly no money, no The question is no whether help. or not you're a murderer. Right. You're doing okay now. I'm doing better. Better. I'm working towards it. Okay, and, I want to get better for my daughter. Yeah, please do. Let me yes. take a break. We'll be back. Thank you. Please welcome clinical psychologist Dr. Andrea McCary to the show. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you. Let, let's, let's talk about this because even though there are two remotely different instances, the basic survival instincts are pretty much the same, are they not? Yeah, and I'll tell you what the similarity is. That sure. These aren't women, these are super women. They took something horrific and they made it heroic. And for that, I am amazed. Absolutely, absolutely. For sure. Maybe you go to and, and, I, and I don't want to, but I, I got to say, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong when I say this. Amy seems to think that everybody has this in them, but I don't believe that everybody has. She does. She believes everybody has yeah. it. Does everybody have this in them? Well, let me tell you what separates victims from survivors. Sure. The survivors are the one whose mind detaches during that moment of a life-threatening situation. If you talk to Sarah, if you talk to Amy, what happened in that, in the midst of the crisis, they had this sense that they were almost watching a movie of themselves, that they were detached. We actually call this depersonalization. And everybody watching, everybody in this audience has experienced it during some type of tragedy or even a good moment in your life, like getting married or giving birth or going to a funeral, where you feel, and I'm sure you've had this, Montel, sure. where you're separated from your body. It's in that moment that you have the moment of clarity, where you're able to come up with a plan and then execute it. And it's, I guess, is it because you are detached, you're not all focused on all the fear and all those exactly. things, so you're really kind of looking. Okay, so, so now, uh, Miss, Miss Safety Chick, but yes. I, I'm trying to figure, I said the, the piece of advice I would give is that no pregnant woman should go visit anybody that they don't know at any time, anywhere on this planet. <laughs> but, uh, I think that's a little unrealistic, but, but yeah. Uh, Safety yeah. in numbers. I think Safety in numbers. Key. Okay, so now now she's stuck in a situation where you're inside of somebody's house. You got those few minutes. What could she also have done? Maybe start dialing that 911 and leave the phone just ringing in her pocket? You know, the, the point is this. It's exactly what you just said, buying yourself that time to get out of the situation. And to be honest with you, it's all about my big philosophy because I, w I actually was a victim of stalking as well where I was kidnapped and the whole bit. So we've all been in these different life-threatening situations. And the key is, is using that moment. And for you, and every situation is different. So for me to go back and do the, you know, Monday morning quarterback is sure. crazy. We'd never do that. Amazing. You know, it was that mother cub. There's nothing stronger than that. That's believe right. me, I know. So... Um, again, I think the bottom line is it's about how to decrease your odds of ever being a victim. So it's doing the work before. It's going back to the plan your dive, dive your plan, you know, knowing where you're going to be prepared. So the common sense thing is to the smart personal safety choice is safety and never is not go alone. But what she did, she, she basically did everything right that she could do in that setting for her Fight thank back. god absolutely you know doc what can we do you know for those of us who doubt ourselves what can we do to start kind of working a little bit on the idea that if in fact something happens i also believe like you say if if you prepare for it you think about it it's like teaching a child you know how to get away from a possible predator you yeah. have to teach it to yeah. them you have to train them at it a couple times run through a few scenarios should we not be sitting around and as silly as it sounds sit in your car for a second and go well, what happens if I go off a bridge? Because honestly, most people don't even stop for a second and remember, where is your door knob <laughs> on your car? Exactly. Where are the locks on your car? Where is the window button? And what happens if you're in an electric car? Do you know how to open your door of your car if the electricity is off? Well, uh -huh. Montel, we got to pay attention. We have to pay attention to the physiological cues in our body. Our body is set up to help us survive. There's something called a sympathetic nervous system, which is the part of our body responsible for fight and flight. And it gives us triggers that we're in a threatening situation. Even if our mind, our, the trusting part of our mind is telling us, no, that's not true. Our heart beats fast. We start to perspire. We start to tremble. Our breathing starts to increase. Pay attention to your body. That's going to tell you you need to get out of this situation. Yeah. All right, let me take a little break. We'll be back right after this.
Well, your website's called safetycheck.com, correct? Yes. And Dr. Andrea, is there a website that people can go on to of to get course. some more information? What is it? DrAndrea.net, and I have tons of uh, different kinds of resources for people in terms of finding a therapist. Congratulations, ladies. I mean, it's, it's an example that a lot of us wish we could live up to. I'm out of time. Join us on the next month's